they just go up to Margaret and throw their arms around her. And we've even seen um, girls crying, and it's uh, really amazing to see how that uh, having something culturally relevant to them, how much that means to them, and having an image in the media or a strong heroine that looks like them and comes from the same sort of similar background to them is is really important. Christy Jordan Fenton is speaking of her mother-in-law, Margaret Pokiak Fenton. But for you to truly understand how Margaret has become this role model and inspiration, we will have to take you back in time first, before her children and grandchildren, before the two ladies were published authors. Secret she kept for almost 65 years. This is the story of a woman who braved residential school after her parents warned her how awful it could be. Dad didn't want me to go. Oh, he said, you're not going to like it. But I think he was surprised that I actually went. I went to school. Even mom, she tried to tell me. She said, they're going to be really mean to you. And I said, that's OK. I don't have to like them. <laughs> Off she went. Her goal was to read and write, which later she would. But the labor and abuse was a shock to the eight-year-old. So when you started unloading the barges, you heard so much that you just think you're going, you're dying. You know, you ache from head to toe. They talk to us and say, well, if you don't convert your parents to believing in their church, then they're all going to go to hell. I thought she was going to kill me. <laughs> But she just picked me up by my neck and she made, told me to stand there. And they had buckets. You had to take that and go down into the basement and dump it into a bigger one. Mm -hmm. She told me I have to go down there with that stuff. So I went down. She turned the lights off. And there's no other light down there. And then I went to the top of the stairs and she had locked the door on me. There was a two-year time span in which Margaret had no contact with her family. The children were offered to make one phone call over Christmas, and Margaret prepared some notes. So I wrote down what I wanted to say, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the unseen what I had written, she said, no, you can't use that. you got to write something else. Tell them you're really happy and they're really good to you. And I looked at her and I said, no, no. This stubbornness is what made young Margaret stand out, and not in a positive way. She was picked on by one nun in particular who was cruel, cutting off her hair and abusing her in other ways. This was the inspiration for her first story, Fatty Legs, where she was forced to wear red stockings as the nun wanted to humiliate the young girl. Until one day, Margaret had enough, and she burned them. She rounded up all the, girl, rounded up all the girls, and they looked high and low, and I didn't want to tell them what I did. I thought, oh, they might kill me. <laughs> it was scary. This nun, who is known only as Raven in the books, made Margaret's life particularly painful, and it wasn't until recently that she could even utter the nun's real name. But I, I don't really like talking about her. A little boy asked me what was her name while I, they were walking out. I said, her name was Sister Laflamme. My boy, he says, and he shook his head. He's just a kid. <laughs> These stories, which were once a secret, are now known by people all around the world. Margaret, with the dedicated help of her daughter-in-law, Christy, published these tales into now known books. They have even been converted into other languages. Coming up after the break, we will hear about how Margaret's life took a turn for the positive when she met someone who put a twinkle in her eye. Before the break, we heard about the tragic past of Margaret Pokiak Fenton, a residential school survivor turned successful author. After all the tragedies and obstacles she faced in her youth, we now get to hear about when something magical happened. I think it was love at first sight. We met at a dance, and we danced the night away. Mm -hmm. And then he walked me home, and he'd come and visit me. She was living in the Northwest Territories, and he was down south. Neither wanted to make the move. 
So one day Margaret decided she could not live without this man and made the journey. And as soon as I seen Lyle come through the door, I said to myself, he's not going to get away from me this time. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, I thought it was romantic. <laughs> the two obviously tied the knot and raised eight children and now many grandchildren. Sadly, Lyle is no longer with us, but he lives on through his family. Margaret reminisces about their younger years, but is also very busy as she travels the country with daughter-in-law and co-author Christy. We've been on the road quite a bit, um, both virtually and physically. So we've been down to Vancouver uh, doing school visits quite a bit, and we just got back from Saskatoon where we were at the Literacy for Life conference which was uh, very exciting because we've seen, oh, I don't know, several hundred students a day that we were presenting to. First time we went uh, far away, like to Halifax, it was quite an experience, uh, such a long flight. I didn't know Canada was that big. <laughs> Maybe two years before that, they had a residential school reunion. Mm -hmm. uh, the survivors, they liked the a stranger at home better because they've never had anything expressed for them and they always kind of go to the first book and everyone kind of is amazed that uh, things like that happened. The books have been made into workbooks found in elementary schools and the Zara Choral Theatre Group has turned it into a live performance. And they're working with Anishinaabe uh, singer and dancer, Serene Carson Fox. And she actually appeared in A Tribe Called Red Sister uh, video. She styled that and choreographed it. So she's dancing the role of Margaret. And they have an actress who narrates. So that's actually touring all over the eastern provinces. The two even Skype in at the end of the show to take questions from the audience. When we were going back in the airport in Saskatoon again, we sat down at Tim Hortons and opened up the laptop and were able to Skype in with an audience that was mostly uh, residential school survivors and their children and were able to answer questions and, and talk with them before we got on our plane. Christy's son, Margaret's grandson, Waylon, is only nine years old, but he plans to keep his grandmother's legacy alive. I get to speak in front of crowds and then they will know the story and, and people will pass it on through generation to generation. Reconciliation really, um, like we worked on our part, me being a stepchild of a residential school survivor, it was a story I cared a lot about, but and Margaret being a residential school survivor was something she cared a lot about, so it feels like we um, contributed our piece to the quilt of reconciliation and now other people are sewing in their pieces, so whether it's the choir or we have a music video with uh, Keith Sokola or any of the other survivors who are now telling their stories, it's all like we're just um, stitching these patches together and everybody's taking ownership of their part of the story. To learn more about Margaret's past, you can find her books in most libraries or online through Anik Press and Amazon. Reporting for Shaw TV, I'm Emily Moyes.